generations to come. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I'm also the co-host of the Down the Stretch Radio Show on Sirius XM Radio. Hey guys, Randy Moss, NBC Sports, and the Buyer Speed Figures. Zoe Cabman here from Saratoga with First Racing. Delighted to be here and delighted to have our guest on first thing. We're going to do things a little bit differently today. We're going to have a couple guests on a little bit later. The Green Group guest of the week will be, excuse me, Gustavo Delgado Jr., the assistant trainer for Mage. But I wanted to bring in Dr. Raul Brass from Root and Riddle to discuss what was the biggest story of the week outside of what happened on the racetrack. And uh, in an eerie coincidence, I suppose you would call it, two horses, both grade one winners, to come from Laminitis last week, Art Collector and Cave Rock. Matter of fact, it happened on consecutive days. Uh, Dr. Brass, uh, just fill us in, first of all, and, you know, think of uh, all of us and the and the not only the three of us here on the panel, but the, the viewers and listeners is Lehman. What is laminitis and how and why does it occur in a horse? Well, I wish it would be that simple to, to describe it. I might take the whole hour uh, doing that, but just to, to simplify it in a way as everything else in medicine, anything that ends up with itis is inflammation. So that's one of the things that I want to make sure that the, the, the community understands or the listeners understands because Laminitis is basically just inflammation of the lamina. And just to give an example, people a lot of times talk about, well, the horse founder, he's foundering. Well, foundering, they, they, they describe that more when there's some sort of kind of displacement, either rotation or, or sinking or some of the things where that coughing bone inside the hoof capsule actually start giving away. So laminitis is just inflammation of the lamina. Uh, what causes it? That, that's the biggest issue because there's many things that can actually cause laminitis having the same end results, but the pathways of how that happened, it's what we haven't figured it out yet and why we haven't been able to prevent laminitis because the different causes and the different pathways that end up having uh, a horse starting with laminitis and maybe having complications of having a mechanical failure, which is will be displacement, rotation, or sinking. So some really, really high-profile horses over the years have lost their lives to laminitis. Uh, Secretariat, probably the best known. I mean, he was only 19 years old. But Sunday Silence um, affirmed. Most recently, uh, the one that got the most attention was probably Barbaro who broke down clearly in a hind leg in the Preakness and then later post-surgery lost his life to laminitis. Are we any closer in medicine, not to finding a cure for laminitis, but for successfully treating something that seems to be so often just a death sentence for racehorses? Yes, I, I think we have come a long way. I mean, uh, I think that our knowledge and our experience and in, in, in the research that has been done uh, obviously, we haven't come into, like you said, to prevent it, but we definitely, definitely have a better understanding and why we realize now that uh, there are those certain occasions that we can't we can't jump in too soon. Let's put it like that, because a lot of times I even actually try to compare uh, laminitis to cancer in humans. I mean, it's, there's a lot of cancers that you can manage and there's a lot of cancers that, that there's nothing that you can do and they will end up dying in laminitis. It's like that. It's different type of presentations, different type of causes. Some horses you can help, some horses you can manage, and there's other ones that for unknown reasons, no matter what you do, they succumb. Because that's the other thing that we have to look into it, Randy. It's more of when it comes into laminitis, it will be ideal if we catch it before it actually start having such a mechanical failure. I look at it in two ways. One is you what caused the laminitis, what triggered it. After you end up having laminitis, then you end up having a secondary circumstances or consequences with it, which will be mechanical failure. You're almost treating two different things. One, you have to treat the primary cause. What is triggering that laminitis, which is going to eventually end up with a mechanical failure? And that's what's happened to many of these horses that, yeah, we catch them having laminitis, but by then the damage is being 
put in place and we're too far behind to try to catch up with them. So I, I do think we have come a long way. I do think we have a, a lot more understanding. There's a lot of more of a diagnostics. You know, we started be, before with RediGraph and then from RediGraph we developed the contrast red graph where we do venograms, which is a, a red graphic study where you put dye into the blood supply and then we can actually look into the blood supply and see if the blood supply is compromised to some extent before we do have some mechanical rotation. Because if you look into laminitis, first we have inflammation of, of, of the lamina and then that makes you wonder what's happening to all that intricate blood supply that goes in through all that. If when we do venograms, sometimes we can catch them before the blood supply is so compromised that then the bone gives away because it doesn't have bone, uh, uh, blood supply. So I, I do think that we know a lot more and we have, we're more efficient, we're more selective, we have a better understanding. Uh, hopefully with, with years we can prevent it, but there's just two different many causes for it because just to give you an example, you can have a horse that may have colic and do from the colic and the toxemia uh, or, or or pneumonia or uh, any disease that will cause any triggering uh, enzymes or, or those triggering factors that actually affect the lamina. Then you have the equine metabolic syndrome, which is horses that have cushions or insulin. Uh, the, the metabolites of how the hoof capsule works is completely different and, 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 and the way with the insulin and the glucose. And then you have horses like the horses at the racetrack that, that out of the blue one day they're sore and, and the next day they're gone. And, and it, you, you start asking yourself, how did this happen? What, what created this one? Well, there is no disease. There is no fever. And you look into Barbara. Barbara was a completely different one as well. That one is contralateral limb laminitis, which is where the horse, it, due to the fracture, has to bear the entire weight on the other foot. So now we're talking about ischemia. It's like when you fall asleep on your arm and your arm goes numb, that's because you don't have any blood supply. Same thing with the horse. The horses have to stand on that leg. He cuts the blood supply. Next thing you know, he founders on that one. And I hate to say it, but, you know, the first, uh, they say that colic is the primary cause of death in horses and laminitis is the second one. To me, it's laminitis still because there's a lot of horses that go in for colic and they don't die from the colic. They actually end up dying from the, the laminitis, same thing with Barbara. They didn't die from the fracture. Yeah, he did to some extent, but they were able to manage the fracture and he ended up having succumbing due to the laminitis on the contralateral limb laminitis. So it wasn't even that cause. So if, in my opinion, laminitis still the first or the, the, the main cause of, of death in horses, unfortunately. So Raul, this is a, a classic case of no foot, no horse. You're a certified veterinarian, you are a certified journeyman farrier, and you are specializing in equine podiatry. Is this basically now your life's mission to perhaps try and find a cure if there is one for laminitis? I mean, we can fly people to the moon, but we can't seem to wrap our heads around this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's, that's my goal. It's, it's like you said, when I went to vet school, uh, I realized no foot, no horse. 80% of lameness is related to the foot. The other 20%, you still kind of influence it with fairy as well. So I said, if I get into podiatry, I'll look at 100% of the horses that are lame. You know, uh, so it started like that. And then it, it follow up through, you know, the frustrations of having to go to sleep and not knowing what, what caused the the laminitis and the horse and trying to find solutions for those ones. That, that's sort of kind of what we do as equine veterinarians. We, we get into this industry because we have a passion for it. We have a lot for it. And, and we want to help horses to continue to for their well-being. And, and, and having seen the many of these horses succumbing and, and, and dying from laminitis, it's not necessarily, you know, a lot of times we, we go to sleep and we're like, what are we missing? What is the missing link? So, Whatever I can do to collaborate and help and find uh, solutions to our problems, yes, that, that's my ultimate goal, to do that. So, Doc, one of the hot-button issues in thoroughbred racing, and, we, and we've talked about this, unfortunately, too often, are the catastrophic breakdowns that get so much attention from the mainstream media. And when people that don't really know horse racing or horses that well – 
see and hear something like that. One of their primary questions to us is why do horses need to be put down when they fracture a leg in a horse race? You mentioned lateral limb laminitis. Is that the primary reason, in your opinion, why so many horses can't be saved? It doesn't make sense to try to save them after a catastrophic injury? Not necessarily. I think a lot of times uh, the decision made at the uh, at the spot at the track by a lot of these veterinarians is because uh, sometimes those type of fractures uh, create so much damage that they're unrepairable um, or cre- or like, let's say when you have condylar fractures or breakdowns where you have the sesamoids that completely the blood supply that that supply those structures are actually damaged as well. So it's not like humans that when you break your leg, you can actually lay down in, 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 in a bed and rest it. Horses have to stand on their legs no matter what. So many times the reason why these horses are being put down at the track is because they assess the, the degree of, of that fracture. And obviously based on the knowledge from those surgeons, they know that the, the outcome of many of those ones will be non-favorable. So that's, that's your only solution. Uh, when it comes into the controlado limb laminitis, if, if the repair or the fracture, it has a, has the choice to, to be repaired, let's put it like that. Those horses don't get put down. Those horses are the ones that actually may be put down later on due to controlado limb laminitis. There are many horses that unfortunately, uh, don't get put down on the track because those breakdowns are actually solvable and, and, and they don't die from that one. Sometimes they die from complications of controlado limb laminitis. Barbara is not the, the ideal example because his fracture was quite extensive, that, which took somebody like Dr. Richardson to, to try to approach such a challenging uh, fracture, but he, he didn't, he died from the controlado limb laminitis. And, and, and unfortunately, I, I have experienced that many times. I get a lot of horses that come down from a breakdown where the, where the fracture is repairable and uh, the horse actually do, do respond to the surgery, but they end up having complications with the controlado limb laminitis because by the time that horse reached the clinic, uh, the damage has been put in, 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 in process already in the controlado and nobody, nobody knows it because that horse is too painful on the other one. So he stands on the controlado like there's nothing wrong with it until they fix the fracture one. And now he starts feeling a little bit better. Now he starts showing you pain on the controlado. So I think that our job as veterinarians is to always try to be as proactive as possible and, and not reactive, not wait and see what's going to happen to the other leg. It's just almost like everything in medicine. The, the sooner you get into it, the better chances you have for a better outcome. And that's that's the same thing about laminitis. Nowadays, we just we just kind of wait. We, we're going to wait and see, and we're going to wait and see. Well, when you see it, it's too late. Raul, I got one more question. When I was a kid growing up in England, the only horses that got laminitis were fat ponies, just from eating too much grass. And we treated it therapeutically, mainly sticking them in buckets of ice, cold water. Are you a believer in any therapeutic treatments for laminitis or do you do you go straight to the vet truck? I mean, is there a way that you can work around it to begin with? No, of course. Again, you know, if you start seeing any any early signs or even if you have a horse that goes to colic or a horse that have pneumonias, that they're prone to develop laminitis has been shown in research like Van Epps that they did in Penn State and Chris Pollitt started where they were doing cryotherapy. They were very, uh, it was quite obvious that to minimize or ameliorate the damage that can happen from that, those horses get started on cryotherapy, but you have to understand there's very specifics about those. I mean, they, that how, how cold those, that, that water and the ice has to be. It has to be, you know, up to a level. It has to be 72 hours uh, nonstop. And a lot of times, some of those things, due to practicality, we start not doing them as well. Well, I put them on ice for one hour, and we took it off. And then I put them on this, and we took it off. So there, there are many... Uh, treatments and therapeutics that can approach the primary 
cause like the disease or the inflammation or the cryotherapy, just to everybody understand. People think that they put them on cryotherapy or ice thinking that they're going to vasoconstrict. It, it, it's, it's not that. What they're trying to do is they're trying to de decrease the, the metabolism of how the hoof capsule is metabolizing everything. They're hoping that they can decrease those triggering factors that are coming in. And you have to look at it. You have the hoof and you got the lamina and then they interdigitate like that. And typically strong. there's a little membrane that goes in between that. When you have laminitis, that membrane goes away. And as soon as that membrane goes away, then you have the rotation. So there are things that you can do for the inflammation, for those kind of things that happen early in the stages of laminitis to try to prevent then the mechanical failure that comes with it. The issue is how early do we notice? How early we can catch up on those kind of things? Because when you see it one day, maybe start it five days ago, you just didn't notice. So yeah, I truly believe on, on, on all of those things that have been proven, but at the same time, they have shown that you have to do them at that time, which that window gets missed quite often. Well, Dr. Brass, thanks for filling us in on a very important subject. And uh, it's nice to know the progress is going to be made. And I'm sure that you'll keep up the good fight so that hopefully this is not such a big problem for the thoroughbred racehorse. Dr. Raul Brass, an expert on laminitis from Rudin Riddle, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I do want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The catalog for the Keeneland September sale is out. They have catalog, catalog 4,194 horses. And for the third straight year, the sale kicks off with a two-day book one, followed by a two-day book two. The latest Keeneland September graduate was randomized who took down the grade one Alabama last weekend. We will discuss her in just a few minutes. She was a $420,000 purchase for Claravich Stable in 2021. Randomized, in case you didn't know, is the fifth, that's right, fifth Alabama stakes winner in a row for Keeneland September sale grads and her half-sister, Bifrosted, will sell the upcoming sale as hip number 1711 with Hiddenbrook. Learn more about the Keeneland September sale, which runs September 11th through the 23rd at the World's Yearling Sale, Com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is a racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse, for generations to come. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Stone Street. Stone Street breads were in high demand at the Fazig Tipton Saratoga sale, selling for a combined $4 million and topped by the $1.5 million cult by Into Mischief out of Rachel's Valentina. Watch out for the 59 Stone Street breads at the upcoming Keeneland September sale from September the 11th through the 23rd. And there's more. Just this past weekend, the Stone Street bread fibber broke her maiden on debut for trainer Brett Calhoun, at Alice Park. Stone Street, born to run, raised to win. In this week's Saratoga Minute, brought to you by Naira Betts, Katie Petruniak checks in with fan favorite channel maker. The high-headed nine-year-old gelding runs this weekend again in the Sword Dancer, and he has a special friend helping him get to the starting gate. I started working for Bill in 95 and kind of went from 95 to 2001 working for him. And then circumstances in life took a break. And in 2020, I came back to work for him during the pandemic because they were having trouble getting help. And so of course, Channel Maker was always one that I followed along with. 
And so when he came up here, I was pretty excited that he was coming. And I remember when I first laid eyes on him, you know, and I just saw him staying in the stall and he was just, to me, magnificent. And there was just something about him that just drew me to him. And then finally I got to walk him one day and like that was it. There's just something that drew me to him and I just couldn't stay away from him. He's got his little idiosyncrasies. He's had, you know, a lot of people that have been with him for a long time. And, and you know, to be honest, I, I don't think anybody in the barn doesn't like have a fond spot for him in their heart. Great piece there by Katie. And you know, I had a chance to speak to Bill Mott just the other day and I'm like, who who is this Gilda that's so in love with Channel Maker? And he goes, that is Channel Maker's lover. And I started laughing. He goes, Zoe, I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. He said, when I bring Channel Maker up to Saratoga, he just blossoms. And he attributed it to Gilda. He said his dapples get bigger. He's a happy horse. And he said, honestly, He's attributing to Gilda. So great job, Gilda. She does the program for Naira by all accounts. She's full-time year-round here at Saratoga, but definitely Channel Maker's girlfriend there. Really lovely story and good to see. And we'll see if he can do it again in the Sword Dancer. Meanwhile, you can sign up now for Naira Bets and get a matching deposit of up to $200. Just make your initial deposit within 30 days of signing up for your account, okay? Bet twice that amount and you'll get a wagering credit equal to the amount of your initial deposit. All you do is sign up with promo code SPA200 and get your deposit match today. Channel Maker will be making a sixth straight appearance in the Sword Dancer Saturday at Saratoga. Um, so let's go back to last week. We'll obviously talk more about the Travers and uh, everything that's going on this weekend. But the big race of the day was the Alabama. And Randy Moss, I hope you bet on randomize. And here's why. You are from the buyer speed figures. And this horse was clearly the fastest horse in the race. Now, I know that doesn't always mean they're definitely going to win. And he went off at seven to one. From the from the beginning of the year, I have been writing and talking about nobody in this division runs fast. And now we not only have a, a horse that won the Alabama, but there's one is doing so and getting some good buyer figures. Now, I understand coming in, there were a lot of questions, particularly the distance. This horse was coming off a win in a mile race. Even Chad Brown brought that up, that he, he was even hesitant to even go in the Alabama. But uh, at the end of the day, they looked at the field. And uh, I think we have now finally a leader of the three-year-old Philly division. She wins by four over wet paint, gets a 98 buyer. And uh, they're not sure what they're going to do with her next. But uh, she's, a, uh, she's fast. She's got tactical speed. And she can carry her speed. And again, at seven to one, Mr. Moss, I hope you had a bet on her. Well, to answer your question, yes, I did. Last <laughs> week on this podcast, I yeah. touted her as being the horse to bet on, right? Wet paint was the logical horse on paper, but at the price, randomized with that buyer speed figure of 97 and with the likelihood that she could control the pace looking at the field, chocolate gelato defined purpose. The only two horses in there that figured to be able to give her any kind of a pace battle and chocolate gelato was a complete no show. So those were the elements uh, that led to the upset win at seven to one by randomized. You mentioned Chad Brown reluctant to run uh, randomized in there after her poor effort in the acorn a little bit earlier, they were initially pointing randomized to the test. But it was Seth Klarman, the owner, who reached out to Chad and said, hey, look, I think we need to look at the Alabama. I think she has an excellent chance based on that figure to win the Alabama. She's a daughter of Nyquist. As you pointed out, the three-year-old Philly division is historically weak this year. Yes, Wet Paint was the horse to beat, but she's a closer. So she's susceptible to pace, traffic, et cetera, et cetera. So Chad looked at it and said, let's enter the Alabama. We'll see what the pace looks like on paper. It looked good. So uh, lo and behold, Randomize gets the wire to wire win. Yeah, and he went in late. And, and you look taller. Are you sitting on a stack of hundreds there, Randy? <laughs> <laughs> you, I wish I'd bet that much, Zoe. <laughs> but Randomize much the best. She looked terrific in the paddock. And when they sprung the latches and I saw Joelle on the lead, going those fractions. On. And you know, if Joel is on the lead, he's got a ton of horse under him because usually he's sleeping out the back, but he was on the lead. I'd already spoken to Ron Anderson. He's like, I'm live in the last few races. 
When I just saw him cruising and wet paint all the way back there, eating dirt, like she has to fight against the elements to close from how far back she comes. But she was just terrific. And it's not just like it was a fluke. She put down solid fractions and finished up and galloped out like a champ. A really, really nice effort by her indeed. Yeah, it's a bit of a handicapping lesson here that 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 maybe people can can use in the future, right? He had three horses in the race that looked like they had any speed at all. Randomized, chocolate gelato, and defined purpose. Both defined purpose and chocolate gelato, while they had some speed, were not the types of horses that on paper looked like they were need to lead types. Whereas randomized on paper, right? That's what Joel Rosario noticed. It's what Chad Brown noticed. It's what Seth Klarman was talking about. It looks like she was decidedly better with the lead. So the intent was going to be much more uh, from Joel Rosario to get to the lead than the riders of Defined Purpose and Chocolate Gelato. And there you see the result. Now, there was a little bit of argy-bargy as well. There was a disqualification with Gambling Girl and Tax flip-flopped with a rad claiming foul against a Bearano. So not without some controversy there. Yeah, can you imagine? A Rad Ortiz claims foul <laughs> and the stewards uphold it, okay? <laughs> yeah, go back to the Jim Dandy, all right? It was enough of a travesty that Forte was not disqualified. Okay, right. but if the stewards are going to look at that and they're going to say, okay, and this is the only possible explanation for not disqualifying Forte. So, okay, he was the best horse. We don't want to disqualify Forte because he was the best. Okay, all right, I can kind of sort of accept that. Leave the number up. But if you leave the number up, you got to give I read days for that ride. Right. You have to. And you can do both. You can leave the number up and choose to give him days for rough riding. The fact that they didn't do either makes the Naira stewards look even more incompetent, in my opinion. There you go. Somebody okay. not happy with the stewards. You don't hear that too often in horse racing now, mm. do you? Uh, no such controversies out of Del Mar and the Del Mar Oaks. Anaset, uh, this isn't the sexiest division, I realize, that three-year-old fillies on the grass. Uh, in uh, They also had the uh, similar race this week, the Lake Placid in uh, at Saratoga, which, of course, is won by Chad Brown. That goes almost without saying. You don't even have to, you know, so you can say that beforehand. It's just which Chad Brown is going to win. But uh, Zoe Anaset for Leonard Powell, she's very good. She came from dead last in there and, uh, uh, you know, looked like she is a uh, – a filly to be reckoned with. They're not going to point for the Breeders' Cup. They're going to stay within the three-year-old filly turf ranks with the Queen Elizabeth coming up. But uh, big win for her, and uh, she is someone to keep an eye on. Three for three since coming over to this country for Eclipse Thoroughbreds. Got an absolutely beautiful ride by Umbi Rispoli. He's second in the standings right now. When Umbi's good, he's very, very good. And he's on fire right now at Del Mar. In fact, he might give Juan Hernandez a run for his money I think he's four behind right now, 24 to 20. But gave her a terrific ride, followed Kent the Sormo the whole way around there. The rail parted like the Red Sea, and she just zipped on through. I'm, I'm disappointed they're not going to try and run her in the Breeders' Cup because I think she's that kind of filly. She likes to hear her feet rattle. We'll have firm turf at Santa Anita. She loves Del Mar. She's done nothing wrong. Eclipse Thoroughbreds did a really good job of managing to find her and bring her over because she is undoubtedly the leader in the division. Now, Be Your Best, I thought, ran terrifically to be second for Horatio de Paz, shipping out from Saratoga. She's been working here all summer. She needs to hear her feet rattle. She likes the firmer turf, and she ran a bang-up second and got grade one placed. But Anna said, wow, she was terrific. That would be a nice feeling to be sitting on her at the head of the lane. That's the type of feeling that... When you're a jockey, you die for. The mm. rail opens and you can just point and shoot. She was a pole the best. In oh. A pole the best. Um, and, and whereas, I mean, she's based in Southern California, as you pointed out, the Breeders' Cup's at Santa Anita. This race was a mile and an eighth. The Philly Mare Turf is a mile and a quarter, which certainly looks like it's within her capability. But when you look at the stats, guys, American-based three-year-old fillies in the Breeders' Cup filly and mare turf have an atrocious record, horrible record. Now, European three-year-old fillies seem to have no problem coming over and winning the filly and mare turf. It's happened multiple times. But American, North American-based three-year-olds just don't ever seem to be able to match up. Uh, so I can understand why they're, you know, why they're giving it another year. 
She's a European. Maybe she could be sort of. the one, right? I don't know. Well, it looks like we're not going to find out this year. Uh, the other big story at Del Mar, and I actually believe it was in the race right before, was a uh, new TDN rising star, Tamara. And the the big appeal to this filly is that she is a daughter of Beholder. Now, it's interesting. Beholder got off to a lousy start as a broodmare. Her very first horse to hit the racetrack was a colt by the name of QB1. And Uncle Moco, Moco, excuse me, an Uncle Moco went 0 for 4. Then he comes back with a filly by the name of Karen with an I uh, by Curlin. She goes 0 for 2. And I was starting to think, you know, this is this going to be just like poor Zenyatta? She's just going to be a bust as a broodmare. And then all of a sudden things turned around. Um, uh, Tina Ella was her, her third foal to get to the racetrack and she won a grade three. And then lo and behold, between uh, after that, they sold the uh, half brother to Tamara by Curlin for $4 million at Fasic Tipton, Saratoga. And then here comes Tamara Breaks her maiden uh, on uh, Saturday at Del Mar. TDN rising star. She overcame a stumble at the start. Not particularly really fast. Got an 80 buyer. But it is so cool to see uh, a daughter or son of Beholder. And we can only hope that they can um, you know, go on to bigger and better things. Because obviously Beholder was such a cool horse. And we want to see her offspring do well. She was terrific. She was terrific. Tamara. Great to see Mike Smith back in the win column at Del Mar. And almost ironic, you know, he was the regular rider for Songbird, that he should be riding a nice daughter of Beholder, who they had such a rivalry with. But Tamara got a terrific ride under Mike Smith and looks like he's loaded. She'll probably head towards the, the Phillies race at the end of the meet. I believe it's September the 8th um, or the 5th. So she'll run there. And uh, the the sister, Tina Ella, she's very good as well. So good to see Beholder. I was actually at Santa Anita when she actually finally won because poor old Dick Mandela had been pulling out his hair, what little he has left, trying to get a winner for Beholder. And when he walked into the winner's circle, he was just like this a sigh of relief to finally get one of her babies to win. So kudos to them. Tamara, she's got a pretty bright future ahead of her. Uh, number one, no hair jokes, Zoe. That's not allowed. <laughs> podcast. Uh, number two, let's give Daddy some credit as well. I know it's all about Beholder, but this is mm -hmm. a horse out of Beholder by Bolt Doro, who has right. turned out to be a heck of a stallion. So uh, Tamara, Tamara, however you want to say her name, is uh, is bred to be a good racehorse top end pop. The TD and Riders Room, also brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Monday, a big day for the PHBA, it was their annual Pennsylvania Day at the Races. Seven $100,000 PA bred stakes at Parks Racing, paying out over a million dollars in purses. It was also the beginning of the two-year-old PA sired PA bred series for this year. Races for two-year-old Colts and two-year-old Phillies at five and a half furlongs. For the Colts, it was the Whistle Pig Stakes. Yes, that was a Pennsylvania bread that made almost a million dollars on the racetrack. It was won by Gambling Ghost, owned by the Calypso Stable, trained by Jason DaCosta, eight to one odds. And the Philly Division, the Miss Blue Tie Dye, another Pennsylvania bred horse in the past that made almost a half million. Uh, won by Jody's Ruby, who made her bid from the inside for owner Gilman Hallenbeck and trainer John Service. The next two races in this Two-year-old PA Sire PA Bread Series, September 23rd. Those will be at six and a half furlongs for purses of $150,000. Again, congrats to everyone in Pennsylvania and with the PHPA on their big day Monday at Parks Racing. The PA Horse Breeders Association presents the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Six races for PA Sire PA Bread two-year-olds at Parks. Two $100,000 contests at five and a half furlongs. On August 21st, PA Day at the Races. September 23rd, PA Derby Day has two races at six and a half furlongs, both with a $150,000 purse. And in December, two races going long, each worth $200,000. For more, go to pabread.com. The Fastest Horse of the Week, brought to you by the Fast Stallions at Windstar Farm. This week's spotlighted stallion, Life is Good. One of the sheer speediest horses we've seen in recent years. Three career losses. His first loss was in the Allen Jerkins at Saratoga 
when he was beaten by Jackie's Warrior, the Equibase comment in that race was overconfident handling. His only other two losses were when they sent him to Dubai for the Dubai World Cup over a very deep Maidan surface at a mile and a quarter. And then the Breeders' Cup Classic, the final race in his career when he took it to flight line early through six furlongs in one oh nine and one. He earned 112 buyer speed figure in the Jan Nehru. That's the most ever by a son of Into Mischief. Nine triple digit buyers in all. His first book of mares, 192 mares he bred, including 70 graded stakes winners or graded stakes producers. So we'll be looking forward to seeing Life is Good's first falls hit the ground next year. Now, the fastest horse of the week ran on Saturday at Woodbine. War Bomber, the winner of the King Edward Stakes with the buyer speed figure of 99. Talk about a good family. War Bomber is by Warfront out of the Danzig Mare, believe it or not, 22-year-old Sun Shower. This happens to be a half-brother to X Celebration, a former Coolmore Group 1 stakes winner who had the distinction of running second or third five times behind Frankel. He won almost all his other starts. And a half-brother to Lancaster Bomber, another Coolmore horse who was second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf and second in the Breeders' Cup Mile. War Bomber, believe it or not, claimed early in his career after he was gelded for $25,000, hadn't shown much before then, by prominent Canadian owner Bruno Schickadance, trainer Norm McKnight. Obviously the horse now has lived up to his pedigree. War Bomber expected to run next in the Woodbine Mile, a race in which he finished ninth one year ago. That's the fastest horse of the week, War Bomber from the King Edward at Woodbine. TD and Rider Zoom brought to you by The Green Group, a tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred business. Just ask Lynn Green. For more information, go to www.greenco.com. And welcome in now this week's Green Group guest of the week and is Gustavo Delgado Jr. He is the son of the trainer of Mage Gustavo Delgado Sr. and also the assistant trainer and big part of the team that has guided maids through this very good three-year-old campaign, which has included a Kentucky Derby win. Gustavo, thanks for joining us. And after Mage got beat in the Haskell, I thought maybe the team would be disappointed. It was a million dollar race, grade one, but all we kept hearing was how happy everyone was with the race. Explain why. Well, uh, first, uh, thank you for having me here, guys. Um, the thing was, we, we didn't expect to run the horse in the Haskell the first time, you know, and and it wasn't until the previous race before the race, and that's when we we felt like, oh, he's 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 back, he's doing real well, and let's 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 put him in a van and let's ship him to Jersey, but we were like, oh, if he, if he does good, fine; if he doesn't, you know, we just keep him. And, and and carry on to until the travers but the, that was an, a nice race that one before right before the uh haskell and that's when we made a decision and then we had a skip one because we have bad weather back in lexington so we only went for the race probably with three races that, that's my guess and yeah pretty much and and we we, we were aware that he wasn't a hundred percent, not even close. So, so we were happy with, with the effort, of course. All right. So the, now you have a jockey change. Uh, can you discuss that a little bit? I mean, I, you know, Jerry Bailey and I always go back and forth about the importance of jockeys when you get to the very, very top level with a horse like Mage. I mean, any top jockey could ride Mage. But how important to you is the fact that Luis Saez has some previous experience with the horse? Well, that was one thing that we took into uh, consideration. Uh, we, we we wanted to, a, a guy who uh, who was being on him before, and Luis throw him in the Florida Derby. Uh, with Javier, what happened pretty basically was you know we we gave him pretty much like a timeline because we we didn't want to wait until you know everybody was committed to other horses, and that that's that that's pretty much what happened. Then that time like pass and then we had uh Kieran and Luis they they always went being you know active asking about the horse and how's he doing and 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 they 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 was being interested on on riding mage again so it's so it so 
it, it probably we have ended up with another rider. <laughs> we might be, you know, but I mean, we, we should be good with, with Lewis. What do you think he learned from him riding him in the Florida Derby? Well, the kind of response he has, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, every time you ask him, he's, he's, he's right there. It's not like uh, all the horses that you have to, you know, give him a couple of tries to, to pick it up. But this is a horse that every time you ask him, he's, he's, he's right there. So he's got a quick response. And as far as long as you time that right, I think um, he's, he's, that's his major uh, weapon, I will say. Two questions. One, Luis Saez was quoted as saying he might have taken him by surprise a little bit with that electric turn of foot he showed in the Florida Derby. Looks like that Louis has been watching his races and, and is he going to try and be perhaps a little bit more patient with him this time? Uh, you know, uh, we haven't had the chance to talk to him, but he's planning to come to the barn tomorrow. But um, well, he's definitely watching the races. Uh, he's he's running against him. He's been running against him, riding all the horses, and it will depend on the, on, on how he breaks from the gate. Uh, uh, so, because the the thing is, last two previous races, he he breaks so well. So I, I don't think that's gonna come back when he like 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 he did in the Florida Derby. He he basically walked out of the gate. I don't think that's gonna come back. I think he's gonna break well. I mean that's. We already know what to do to make him, you know, jump out, out of the gate like he did the two previous times. And I, 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 I don't think that he's going to go either behind these horses or not. But our only one is a clean race, good tempo in the first half of the race, and then everybody makes a clean move. And, and I, think, I think we got a decent shot, especially because – I like the draw, though. I like the four. I like 40 in the one hole. I like him <laughs> inside. And I like Arcangel right next to him, too. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. That's, that's, that's the thing about these races. Because, you know, I, I wonder what Javier is going to do. He's going to be taking care of the one inside. Or he's gonna, I mean, it's, it's fun. Uh, I mean, are, are, you surprised, the week. are you surprised that he hasn't been able to keep a jockey? Saez got off him after the Florida Derby to ride tap it twice. You're losing the guy that won the Kentucky Derby on him to Archangelo. What's this little horse got to do to keep his jockey? I don't think we'll lose Javier, to be honest. It's just a matter of, you know, uh, give him a timeline. That, that, that's what happened. And, and, and then he wasn't able, it was an easy uh, decision for him, though. Um, you know, having a Derby winner for his first Derby win. And then Archangelo, who is a horse that, um, I understand he he breezes all the time and he's more like more uh, uh, active in that regard because because with us it's just you know it's at the races everybody has their you know their opportunity and and he clearly again he had a time and he passed and then we uh, we we decided to go all the way but again he's still family though he was in the band this morning so almost uh, you know, broke coffee that kind of thing. Uh, Gustavo Forte is the seven to five morning line favorite. You faced him twice in the Fountain of Youth in the Florida Derby. He finished ahead of Mage both times, but that was several months ago. Make a case for why to people will say, well, gee, isn't Forte the better horse of the two because of that? Make a case why things can be different this time around. Well, I think that the thing that changes the most is, is uh, the lack of experience he had before. Um, understand that he faced 14 only his second start. And that's what we had to do. Well, I mean, we had to do that in order to gain the points to get into the derby. Um, we wouldn't have done that. We probably wouldn't be talking about a derby winner because he, uh, I understand he gained 10 points in the final of youth and then 40 in the uh, Florida derby. And that's why he was, you know, he got in the race. So would we have taken a more conservative route, like 1X and then uh, another thing, uh, probably we could have ended up being going straight to the Prignes or so. something else, but not a dairy winner. So whatever is, is um, it's more experienced now. It's not, a, it's not just a baby. So, um, 
I think he's 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 uh, he's more mature, and we he only we got to know him better too. That's important. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Bill's question again in a slight in a slightly different way. Okay, most people, myself included, that are handicapping the Travers narrow it down to Forte versus Mage, and when you narrow it down to those two horses, you got to look at the Florida Derby specifically. I don't remember a major derby prep race in which people have more of a differing view of the way that race was run. Some people think, okay, Mage broke slowly from the gate. True. Absolutely blew Forte's doors off at the three-eighths pole. Left him for dead. True. And then maybe moved too soon. And as a result of that, that's the reason why Forte came from behind to beat him. Some other people think Forte just is a determined horse. He knows where the finish line is. He refused to lose. That's the reason why he beat Mage. Okay. Where do you come down in the Florida Derby? Who do you think was the best horse in that race? I know you're biased. What do you think? Correct. But, I mean, the fact that Luis rode him first time in that race – when he passed Forte, at that point, Forte was, you know, you could see Ira asking him for it to go. He was off the bridle. He didn't want to go. My guess, and I haven't talked about Lu- with Lewis about this, my guess, like what I, what, I, what I thought, what I still think today, is that he, he thought that Forte was done, to be honest. He, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, you're watching the other horses and, and he was keeping an eye on Forte clearly, and he said, "Oh, this is done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pass him and take care of the other ones because I'm, I'm seeing this horse. He's, he's, he doesn't want to run. He, I mean, and then he basically stopped, you know, giving him importance. And actually, when Forte uh, runs by him on the outside, I think that surprised him, and, and you could, you could tell that." There was plenty of options for Luis that he could have done, either going a little bit on the outside, just, you know, stuff that they do every day uh, in order to protect the race. But he wasn't even trying that. He just was taking, um, paying attention to the horses that he had inside, which was uh, it was Javier, with uh, I forgot the name of the horse. But you could see that that's my thought, though. I mean, that, 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 that's what I think would happen. You know, he 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 thought Forte was done, and he surprised him right at the wire. That's that's what I think happened. But I haven't talked to him though. How's he handled the track here at Saratoga? Because it seems like in watching him train and work in the morning each week, he's got a little bit better leading up to his last work, which I thought was terrific for Mage, who's who's not really a very flashy workhorse by any means. No, he's not. And it's funny because people that doesn't know him and that doesn't watch him every day, you might say, "Oh, this horse doesn't look like he's a he's a." Uh, 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 but that's the thing, we know him, uh, and we have seen him going even you know more choppy, more whatever you can you might say, and he's actually doing really good. And as you said, the 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 fact that we came here on time and he's getting to know the track and having a couple of races at, at, at the track that's that's been on his favor and he's getting better i think he's getting good at the right time to be honest well gustavo thank you so much for your time going to be quite a interesting travers the three triple crown winners coming back against forte last year's two-year-old champion best of luck with major and the travers and thanks for helping us out today on the thank TVN you guys no thank you for having me as the Green Group guest of the week, Gustavo Delgado Jr. will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from the Green Group, who specializes in helping people in the thoroughbred industry save money on their taxes. If you don't believe us, check for yourself at www.greenco.com. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse Award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. 
His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the KTOB. Now we talked about how each of the past five Alabama winners were Keeneland sales grads. Five of them are also Kentucky Breads, guys. Can you name them? There are five, some of them more recently than others. Any ideas? Stump me on that one, Zoe. Right, right, right. It, it, suppose the question again. Keeneland sales grads. Yes. Kentucky okay. bred. Kentucky Winning bred. Alabama, past five years. Who are they? Can I, can I go to Wikipedia? Can I, can Hang on. Google it? <laughs> you know, all right. I'm, I thought Randy could get this for sure. Randomize. Nest. Malathat. Swiss Skydiver and Dunbar Road. Coveted yearlings and grade one winning racehorses are bred in Kentucky. Find your next Kentucky bred at the upcoming Keeneland September sale. You could have had that, Randy. I'm ashamed of myself for not immediately coming with Nest and Malathat. <laughs> there you go. So Saturday is Travers Day, and uh, as we're recording this on Wednesday afternoon, they have drawn the race. They That's the only race they've drawn on the card. Uh, and there is a field of seven, as expected, Forte, the seven to five favorite, drew the rail. Uh, Archangelo made the five to two second choice, uh, and the Kentucky Derby winner, Mage, you heard uh, just a few minutes ago from Del Gustavo Delgado, uh, is third choice at four to one. You also have National Treasure, the Preakness winner at eight to one. So you have the three Triple Crown winners coming back against last year's two-year-old champion Forte and the winner of the Jim Dandy. Um, and uh, T.D. Thornton in the Thoroughbred Daily News uh, noted that since 1978, this is the fifth time all three Triple Crown winners have come back to face one another, or written all three winners of Triple Crown races have come back to face one another in Travers. And Every single time, the winner was someone else, not one of the Triple Crown winning horses. So I guess that means Forte is probably going to win this race. Um, Randy, I, I, you know, without the, we don't have the past performances here. I, I, I need to look at it a little bit more um, carefully. But um, I have not been a Forte fan um, for a lot of reasons uh, throughout this. So I, I can't jump on his bandwagon now as he's going to be the favorite. I'll give Mage another chance. I know Forte uh, beat him in the Fountain of Youth and the Florida Derby, but I just think he's a better horse uh, since then. Uh, you heard Gustavo Delgado Jr. talk about how much, uh, in hindsight, they really did like his race in the in the Haskell. They didn't think he was really cranked up for that. I think he's going to improve, and that'll be my tepid selection. Yeah. How about you? I'm right there with you, Bill. Uh, we did the Haskell on NBC. And we made a specific point before the race about how uh, Mage had been undertrained going into that race, about how he was not going to be 100 percent. And if he gave a solid, for example, solid second place effort, then it could be considered almost as good as a win moving forward for the Travers. And that's exactly what happened. He looked like he could even win the race at the quarter pole when he moved up to go rocket ride. And then go rocket ride out, ran in the final quarter. Maybe Mage, likely Mage was just a little bit short. Not not hugely confident that he can turn the tables on Forte. Uh, after all, as you know, we pointed out in the uh, Green Group Guest of the Week segment, uh, they've run against each other twice, and Forte beat Mage both times. Uh, and like you, I'm not a huge fan of Forte. These people that are voting him like number one or number two in the Breeders' Cup Classic rankings – yeah, I think that's a little bit high because I think he's going to have to run faster than he's ever run before 
uh, to approach that level. Maybe we'll see it on Saturday. I will say this about Forte, though, Zoe. In the Jim Dandy, if I read Ortiz had just stayed on the rail instead of doing what he did, I think Forte would have won that race by daylight. So maybe that's a point in Forte's favor. What do you think? I'm in full agreement. If he'd have just ridden his own horse instead of everybody else's, he's going to win easily. That was first time with the blinkers on last time. He's been working in the blinkers. Todd kind of plays around with his horses. He doesn't always work them in blinkers if they wear blinkers because he wants them to feel that initial sharpness. But he's kept them on. So I think Forte is definitely the horse to beat. You've got Tappet Trice in there. He gets the blinkers on. Whether that's going to help him or not, I don't know. He always trains great. I'm over him. And then Disarm. <laughs> gets the blinkers on. He's worked terrific with the blinkers on for Steve Asperson. There's one just to think about if you've watched some of his recent works. Scotland is in there. He always works very good. It's just a really interesting race. But the horse who's piqued my attention most by his works is definitely Archangelo. He just glides over this track like it's butter. Energy, rhythm, in hand, he seems to do it all. Is he fast enough to beat Forte? I'm not sure, but he's going to give it his best shot. Horse that uh, is getting no um, no mojo or no attention is the Preakness winner, National Treasure. I don't like him either at 8-1. to one. I, I just think the Preakness was not nearly as good a race as the Belmont or the Kentucky Derby, and you have the Belmont and Kentucky Derby winner coming out of that. Uh, but he's eight to one. We uh, disarm blinkers on for Steve Disarmo, eight to one. Scotland for Bill Mott, 12 to one, uh, is the longest shot on the board, along with Tappa Trice. Uh, Randy, if it's not Mage, do you see any one of those eight to one, 10 to one, 12 to one types getting in there? I don't like National Treasure. Not only was the Preakness a weaker race, but he also was gifted the win with uh, historically slow early fractions in there. So, unless he really takes a big step forward for Bob Baffert uh, off of that form. I don't think his Preakness form is good enough to win the Travers. Uh, Scotland did get a 99 buyer speed figure in his last race in the Curlin, a race that's been, uh, you know, historically a prep for the Travers, but he controlled the pace that day. Now maybe he'll be able to set the pace again. When you look at the race on paper, national treasures got speed, but not a ton of speed. There was just no speed in the Preakness against him that day. Uh, you know, maybe Scotland would have a chance in there. But I think, honestly, and Archangelo, he got a perfect trip in the Belmont Stakes. That's why I've probably discounted him maybe more than I should, uh, hugging the rail all the way around, slipping through on the inside, cutting the corner, turning for home. Uh, maybe he's good enough. But to me, it just comes down to Forte versus Mage, uh, part three. And if you'd have asked me about Mage a month ago, I'd have said absolutely not. But he has definitely trained better every day moving forward to the Preakness. I mean, to the Travers, which is his next race. So he's doing as good as he could possibly do right now. Four grade one races on the card, including the Travers, the Forgo. Elite Power will be the big name in there. The H. Allen Jerkins, Bob Baffert uh, is going to be very well represented with the Arabian Lion and Fort Bragg Arabian Lion coming out of a win in the Woody Stevens uh, in the three-year-old male sprint division, which I think be the number one horse out there and um again the sword dancer going uh, long on the turf uh we will uh, find out later today the entries for those races but on friday as well at saratoga another big race the personal ensign and it's the rematch between clarier and nest after the shoe v where nest was a pretty handy winner i guess wrong on, i'd like nest but i guess wrong on clarier every single time Every time I love her, she gets beat, and then uh, I co she comes back. I loved her in, in the shoe V, and, and Nest uh, was a pretty handy winner. Secret Oath is in the race as well, but doesn't look like she's on her best form for uh, trainer Wayne Lucas. Guys, got any thoughts on the personal answer? It's hard to go against Nest for me. She's been working so well in the morning to listen to Todd Pletcher wax lyrical about her. Oh, my goodness me. He has such praise for her, and, and Julie noted she's a very, very good filly, but she – certainly is one of his absolute favorites right now. And she's doing nothing wrong moving forward. She has worked very well each and every week, has not really missed a day or a note. A couple of points I want to make about Nest and Clarier. First of all, if you are a speed figure handicapper and you're looking at the buyer speed figures, I want you to keep in mind 
that uh, the buyer speed figure for the their most recent start in the shoe V uh, is misleading only because of the pace scenario. Uh, the half mile in 49.87, six furlongs in 114.43, uh, severely compromised uh, the final time of that race. Uh, oftentimes we make adjustments to the figures based on pace. That's usually on the turf, sometimes on the dirt. In this particular case, we didn't. 94 for Nest is the official winning buyer speed figure, uh, a 90 for Clarier finishing second. If I'm handicapping the race, though, and I am handicapping the race, I, I, I look at that as being really, uh, for all intents and purposes, 10 points better than that. So I would handicap the race as if Nest is coming off a 104 buyer in the shoe V and Clarier is coming off her normal 100 buyer. Okay, this is fascinating to see these two run again. But I tell you what, I've got such a high opinion of Nest. I vote in the Breeders' Cup Classic weekly poll. And I haven't talked, it, it's, it's my bad. I haven't talked to Mike Rapoli about the possibility, but I do think there is a possibility. I put White Abario number one based on his win in the Whitney. I have Ness number two. Now I know Mike Rapoli already has Forte and Forte is, is high on that list for some other people. But look, they ran Nest in the Belmont Stakes uh, against the boys as a three-year-old. She ran really well to finish second to Mo Donegal. The older male division is pretty weak this year. Uh, I think that Nest would not only fit in the Breeders' Cup Classic if, he, if she continues on her best form, I think she could potentially win the Breeders' Cup Classic at a mile and a quarter. So I think it's going to be very tempting uh, for, uh, for Mike Rapoli and Eclipse Thoroughbreds, the owners, uh, and others to uh, to maybe toy with the idea if Ness continues running well of trying her against the boys in the classic rather than running her in the distaff in which she'd be a, a a huge favorite theoretically for less money. But Randy, isn't really logically the only scenario where that could happen is if Forte somehow doesn't make the Breeders' Cup Classic. Why would they want to run their two horses against one another? I don't know. It's the Breeders' Cup Classic. It's six million dollars. It's if you can't, if you can't or don't win with Forte, and you've got Nest in there, uh, you may be able to win with Nest as well. I mean, we've seen owners in the past run horses with, you know, maybe not a filly and a male, but uh, I tell you what, all I can say is, if I own Nest, and I had a choice, if she continues to be Clarier, okay, and then they're the, clearly the two best mares in the country, I think, uh, even with a Dare Manor in California. Uh, if I had a choice between running Nest at four to five in the distaff for $2 million, or is it three now? I'm not sure. I think it's two. Or running her against another one of my horses, Forte, for $6 million in the Breeders' Cup Classic in a race that I think she could win. I think she's better than Forte. Wow. Well, doesn't, doesn't Eclipse own more of Nest than Mike Rapoli? He's a minority owner. He's the majority on Forte. And then he would be the minority on Nest unless he's purchased 90% oh. of her. I don't know. I think Nest can outrun Forte. So that's why oh, I would seriously consider uh, the Breeders' Cup Classic for her if she continues on her current trajectory. Nest is best. Nest is best. <laughs> well, that question will be more easily answered after Friday. Let's see if she can beat Clarier again in the personal incident, Sarah Tobin. All right. Meanwhile, I already mentioned him once. I'm going to mention him again. Archangelo is this week's XBTV Work of the Week seen here. Working with Javier Castellano, who's been his regular pilot in the afternoon and the morning, he went a handy five furlongs in 101.63. And if you watch him switch leads down the lane, he absolutely loves this racetrack. I'm not sure there is a smoother horse on the grounds right now than Archangelo, who looks stellar coming in. Will he be good enough? I'm not sure, but it certainly won't be because he doesn't like the track. Here's a good look at Art Angelo. We'll be right back after this message from XBTV.
all the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. TD and Riders are brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie. A couple of horses to point out here. West Point got their latest win at the spa. It's always good to win at Saratoga with Mount Up, who now has two wins in two seconds after winning an allowance race on Sunday. And last week at Colonial Lounge on the Arlington Million undercard, West Point and partners got a win with Integration, a three-year-old first-time starter by Quality Road out of Harmonize. Okay, Harmonize is a grade one winner ran all of her races on turf, so they ran integration. Trainer Shook McGahee did. Brought her to Colonial Downs, along with Never Explain, who was running in the Arlington Million. Ran her in a maiden race in a mile and the 16th, or him, integration. He won it by six and a half lengths on debut. Looked really good winning by her speed figure of 85. That's Mount Up and Integration, the two most recent winners for West Point Thoroughbreds. So before we wrap up the show this week, I want to just make mention of the loss of Anthony Maganero from Siena Farms, who passed away on Sunday at age 79. And uh, I've interviewed uh, thousands of people in this industry, and, and I would have to say this was the smartest guy I've ever met in horse racing. He wow. was so bright. He was so innovative. Every, all the rest of us were playing checkers. He was playing chess. That's the way he was. Uh, great guy, um, a native of Everett, Massachusetts, grew up going to Suffolk Downs, made a lot of money in uh, various businesses in Maryland. And uh, this is the type of guy that uh, we need a thousand more Anthony Maganeros in this sport because he was an innovator. He was a good person. He was successful. And like I said, uh, you know, he was always looking out for the betterment of horse racing and uh, had a lot of really, really smart things going on for him. Well, was, once again, uh, yeah, associated with Sienna Farm, uh, mm -hmm. like to keep a low profile. You heard a lot about the owners of Flight Line, right? You heard a lot about all the various owners. A lot of people didn't even realize that he was one of the partners in the ownership of Flight Line. Also, always dreaming, the Kentucky Derby winner, right? You hear a lot about the, you know, the Vinnie Viola, Mike Well, He was also a part owner of Always Dreaming as well. So very high profile owner. Yeah, big loss for horse racing. Well, I want to thank Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman, my cohorts here on the Thoroughbred Daily News Podcast. And I also want to uh, thank Katie Petruniak, Anthony LaRocca. They are our co-producers. Our Green Group guest of the week, Gustavo Delgado Jr. Our editors, Leah LaRocca and Nathan Wilkinson. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Have a great Travers, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>